Welcome everybody to uh, our latest in our series of uh, survey methods seminars um, brought to you by the ESS uh, survey team, NATSEN and um, City University. I'm delighted to welcome today Ranjit Singh from GASIS, um, who's going to be talking to us about uh, how to uh, harmonize uh, data uh, survey data across different survey modes, a topic which is uh, close to a lot of our hearts, I'm sure. Uh, Ranjit is a postdoctoral uh, scholar at GASIS, um, uh, where he practices uh, research, design and survey data harmonisation. So over to you, Ranjit. Thank you, Debbie. Today I'm going to talk about uh, harmonisation, that is efforts to increase comparability and in this specific case, I'm trying to increase comparability of survey data across different survey modes and indeed a, a timely topic, uh, as Debbie already said. Um, I think in such a complex topic, it's best to start out with something that we're all very familiar with, I think, um, and that is the total survey error framework. And I kind of grabbed uh, a figure from Groves et al. Um, and all I'm uh, trying to, to get across with that slide is, is this idea that when we design a survey, we are usually focused on the difference between what we have in our data set and the social reality we're trying to capture. And usually in the total survey error framework, we kind of divide sources of error that kind of remove our data from the social reality we are trying to capture uh, into two categories, which is errors of representation and errors of measurement, of course. And errors of representation are all kinds of errors that kind of make a difference between, you know, the sample population, if you like, and the target population that we actually have, uh, uh, the society we're trying to, to measure, for example. And then for people where we have obtained a data point, uh, er errors of measurement come into play. And those basically uh, mean there is a difference between the value we have in our data set and the actual true value, if you like, inside people's minds, in essence. Mm. And I will, in this talk, mainly focus on errors of measurement because this is my area of expertise, but we will touch upon errors of representation because they also play a role in isolating measurement errors, as we will see in a second. But the main purpose of this slide is to remind us that if we design a survey or assess its quality, we kind of want to reduce the total survey error by kind of reducing any uh, survey error source. And when we now move over to, to the kind of the universe of, um, of harmonization and comparability, uh, that focus shifts slightly. So what we now have is actually not one total survey error, we have two, and we have indeed two sets of survey errors, one for each mode. So I will always talk about mode A and B because what I'm going to say is kind of applicable to all kinds of combinations of modes. I don't, I kind of approach that empirically and not, uh, and not from the specific mode type. But let's imagine for a second, mode A is an interviewer-based format and mode B is a self-administered web-based format, for example. And when we are trying to assess comparability and improve comparability, the focus is now not to reduce the total error. Instead, the focus is to ensure that all error terms are as similar as possible across the two survey modes. So differences in errors across survey modes decrease comparability. So this comparative error idea is what will guide uh, all of the points I'm going to make. And such differences in measurement error mean we bias an all analysis uh, where we kind of run analysis across data gathered in different modes, be that in multi-mode surveys or in surveys that across their time series change their mode. And this is what we're trying to assess, and this is what we're trying to mitigate if any differences occur. Now, as I said, I'm focusing on comparable measurement, so the measurement part of the error framework. And the question arises, what is comparable measurement across modes? I'm starting out with an intuition, and I'm making use of a very abstract concept, and that is the concept of a true score from, from psychometry, and I mean that in a very theoretical kind of sense. So imagine for a second that there is a value for the concept we're trying to measure inside people's minds, um, and that is completely free of any measurement error. 
But when we try to capture that with a survey, we project that true value, for example, a certain level of you know, political interest or something, uh, we project that onto an actual number, an observable number in our data set. So this is the whole measurement process. And this kind of projection process should work the same in two modes, which means if we look at it from the direction of the respondent to our data set, it, it, this means that respondents with the same true score should uh, give the same response on average, regardless of the survey mode we subject them to. But the same perspective, we can also kind of look at it from the other direct, uh, direction, um, which is more important for people analyzing, uh, uh, kind of uh, using our data for analysis. And that is the same response score in our data set should allow the same inferences about its respondent regardless of the data mode. And this is, I guess, the very basic idea that we are striving for when we're trying to establish comparable measurement across survey modes. Now, while helpful as a general intuition, it absolutely doesn't help us to pragmatically solve those issues. So um, I would propose that we kind of divide and conquer. We split the whole problem into components, uh, components of comparability. It's a framework I always use when I try to establish comparability across different instruments, like questions with different wording. But I think it really fits well uh, if we look at comparability between survey modes of a specific measurement as well. So I'm at this point focusing on comparability of a specific measured concept with a specific instrument. So this is the level of detail we're currently looking at. And if I'm looking at the measurement quality and comparability across different modes, um, I will start out with basically the comparability of concepts. Are we measuring the same thing? This is the domain of systematic errors, uh, which may differ between the survey modes. And then I'm asking myself, do I measure whatever I measure comparably, uh, uh, comparably reliably across modes? So comparable reliability means similar levels of random error across different modes. And the last component isn't really an error, but it still can create comparability problems. And that is, are the measurement units comparable across different modes? Um, and what I mean by that will become more clear in a second. But if you think again of the example of political interest, does a three in our data set imply the same level of political interest in both modes? That is kind of the idea behind measurement units. But again, step by step, the three components. First, again, the comparable concepts. Um, that is, I guess, a central issue. Do we even measure the same concept? I mean, the social sciences, that's not always clear because our concepts are hidden inside people's minds and they are not like temperature or size or time. Um, but for survey mode comparability, I hope, or at least I, I feel confident in saying that we usually will not find extreme substantive differences in question understanding across survey modes, given we have designed both survey modes well. I mean, some very complex social uh, structural questions may be an example, uh, exception, but if I ask you verbally how interested are you in politics or whether you uh, or if you read that on a smartphone screen i think the hope is that you will understand the words much the same however that still does not mean that concepts are really comparable across survey modes because there's the issue of other sources of systematic error that may contaminate our measurement and this is crucial contaminate them to different extent in our survey modes so the problem of comparability occurs not when there's a systematic error present in measurement, but when the systematic error differs between modes. A classical example in mode research is the question of whether socially desirable responding has more of an impact perhaps when an interviewer is present as compared to when I sit on my couch in my pajama pants and re respond to a survey on my smartphone, for example. And this would create substantive differences in measurement across the modes. Moving on to the second component, we have the idea of comparable reliabilities. Reliability is nothing else than the inverse of random error. And random error is a kind of non-systematic error variance. It's the good kind of error in the sense that it does not shift our measurements systematically in one direction, 
but it spreads the values we measure around our true uh, around the true score. Now, despite being the better kind of measurement error, uh, random error still is an issue because of attenuation. So the basic rule is the less reliable a measurement, that is, the more our measurement is subject to random error, the lower are all correlations in our analysis that involve that measured variable. So lower reliability, lower empirical correlations in any kind of correlative analysis. Now, that happens in single mode data as well, of course. But the problem that um, a problem may arise if the survey modes have different levels of reliability for our measurement. That would imply that in one survey mode, we suddenly have spuriously lower substantive correlations in our analysis simply because it measures less reliable. Again, a difference that we should be aware of and that we should uh, at least assess um, between modes. Now, the last issue may not be quite so obvious as the first two, and that is the idea of comparable measurement units, but it's something I'm, I'm working on a lot in, in the recent years. Um, and measurement units sounds really strange, but the idea is uh, this. So for many concepts in the social sciences, we actually deal with, or at least we think of the concepts as, uh, as continuous. There are no clear steps in political interest, for example, no natural categories, basically. It's a gradient of interest from extreme interest to no interest at all, or, or at least that is how we treat it in analysis, and that is how we theoretically approach it usually. Now, the measurement process takes that continuum and forces it into a discrete, ordinal, or sometimes pseudometric measurement scheme. So below, we see an example where we force that continuum of political interest into four response options that is very interested quite hardly or not interested at all. And the idea um, of measurement in this case, uh, drawing a bit of inspiration from psychometry, is that people choose a response option depending on their position along the continuum. So here we have an example respondent who will choose a two, quite simply because they are interested in politics, but not extremely so. So after all that pretext, why is that a problem in mode comparability or potential problem in mode comparability? Well, if we, uh, if we change the mode of our survey, it may be that those thresholds so that uh, so that uh, that kind of cut the continuum into segments for the different responses, the thresholds may in fact shift. So for people familiar with it, this is basically a very simplified version of, of, of an IRT model, but basically we have shifted thresholds in the sense that suddenly our example person will choose a one in the new survey mode instead of previously a two in survey mode A. And this can easily happen. Imagine smartphone screens and you have a vertical scale and the response options may, be, may become more, more attractive to respondents if they are higher up, especially so if some of the response options of a larger scale require you to scroll and people may instead choose those they see immediately. Um, and such changes in measurement units are obviously something we have to tackle as well if they occur. Nothing of this has to happen, uh, we just have to check for it. Now, after laying upon you lots and lots of scary uh, components of, of incomparability, I'm going to present four ideas to assess and hopefully to some degree mitigate mode comparability issues. Uh, I kind of chose four approaches uh, that I hope, I, I at least hope some of them will be novel to you and interesting to you. And um, I also chose approaches that are pragmatically applicable to many projects in the social sciences or so I hope, um, but obviously this is not all that can be done. It's a, it's a very small uh, selection of possible approaches. Um, another issue is that the very first approach is only applicable to psychometric multi-item scales. I just included it to remind you that if you have a psychometric multi-item scale, there are very formally established ways of assessing comparability. But for the most of us uh, in the social sciences, we have single item measures. So all three other approaches will deal with that. Um, so we will start out with formal measurement and variance testing for multi-item scales. And then we will move on to using construct 
validity in essence, to look at conceptual comparability and comparable reliability. Then we will align measurement units with an approach called observed score equating. And lastly, we will look at a meta-analytic approach. Specifically, we will look at the survey quality predictor, um, which is basically an interface for a very large meta-analysis that may help us get an insight into generalizable mode effects that are true for many different instruments, which is something that would be very helpful um, for practitioners. Now, as I said, first formal measurement invariance testing, and I will not explain that in detail. It's just that many of you are already aware of this, and I'm sure many in the audience will have already applied such methods. Um, but just to give you a general gist, um, if you have a scale with several items and all of those items represent the same concept, then we can learn a lot about the measurement process by looking at how they interrelate to each other. Basically, we extract what all items that represent one concept have in common. And this is then a far purer, more truer estimation of the concept or value of a respondent than each separate item would be. This is the idea that is behind any factor analytic approaches. And what we can then do is do a very formal sort of factor analysis called a confirmatory factor analysis to assess aspects of uh, the concept we're trying to measure, like the factor structure. We can assess easily the reliability of our instrument. We have some insight into measurement units and so on. Now, this is relevant for mode comparability because what we can also do is estimate such confirmatory factor analysis in both modes, in our case, mode A and B. And then we can compare the performance of those factor analytic models in the two modes because they should work very similarly, all the coefficients should be very similar if our measurement works similar across the two modes. And this is, in a nutshell, the idea of multi-group confirmatory factor analysis to assess measurement invariance, which is kind of a psychrometric way of saying uh, comparable measurement across contexts. Mm, I will point out some some. Uh, some, some advantages and disadvantages of that approach, but please keep in mind um, you need psychometric multi-item instruments for that. Uh, but if you have them, it's extremely elegant because with one approach you get insight into all the components of comparability we just discussed in a very well-established formal and powerful framework with lots of literature um, on it. Um, problem to a degree is, however, that actually interpreting your specific analysis can be complex. So it's not, it's part art, part science sometimes. Um, and you need quite a bit of expertise to, to kind of delve into why measurement invariance occurs and so on and so forth. Um, but it's absolutely worth it if it's applicable to your projects. However, please keep in mind, it's not a panacea. It's not a magical one that we can wave at comparability. Uh, all confirmatory factor analysis models have assumptions that have to be met and they can be blind to some kinds of errors. So if one mode kind of affects all items in a scale in the same way, so if you have a bias that affects every item in a very same way, sometimes that can be invisible to a factor analytic model. So if, for example, a socially desirable responding kind of increases all responses to all items in a very similar way, that may actually not register in a multi-group confirmatory factor analysis, which, why, uh, which is why it's important, for example, to use instruments that have inverted items uh, if you want to make such a comparison. So just keep in mind, it's not a solution for everything, but it's a very powerful tool. Um, and obviously that is not my idea. It's something that is routinely done. I added two examples to the slide uh, where people do actually apply that to multi-item instruments across different questionnaire modes. But uh, if you are like me, your work usually deals not with multi-item scales, but instead single item indicators of a concept, like one question about political interest, and that's it. Um, and if that is the case, we need other solutions, because we cannot apply uh, factor analysis with less than three items. Mm. And what I will propose at first to look at conceptual comparability and perhaps giving us a chance at least to find biases between, uh, between modes, as well as 
perhaps looking into, uh, into reliability, as we'll see in a second, uh, I propose to use something very mundane, something that we've already used uh, probably in our research when we looked at a single measurement instrument. Uh, if we design a new measurement instrument, it is routine, I would say, to, to correlate what we've measured with related concepts, concepts where we know that they should be highly related to our measurement, quite simply because the theory says so or empirical literature says so. Um, a bit more in detail, we may apply what psychomet uh, psychometrists would call construct validity. We may correlate it with concepts that are theoretically highly related to what we measure. We may also correlate our measurement with things where we know it should be unrelated. Um, so competing constructs that we don't want to measure, it's called divergent validity. And of course, we can simply correlate our measure of interest with other measurements uh, 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 that, that represent outcomes that we are interested in, um, which is called criterion validity. And this is usually done to assess the quality of a single instrument, perhaps a new instrument version, like a new question wording. But what I propose instead is why not do the same in the two modes? So basically we do the validation process by correlating it with things where we know it should be correlated in the two modes, and then we compare the outcome across the two modes. Ideally, this is in a setting like a random mode experiment or another setting where we can be pretty sure that the correlations, the true correlations are similar. Of course, you cannot validate one mode in one country and then the other mode in another country where those correlations may actually in reality be different. They should be similar in the population, obviously. So what does that mean in less, uh, in less abstract terms? I have brought you a toy example. Um, Imagine we have measured interest in politics in both modes, and then we kind of uh, we simply correlate it with uh, variables where it's immediately apparent that they should be correlated to interest in politics. So an interest in politics should predict to some extent an interest in TV news, an interest in political TV shows. It should predict how well we understand to some degree uh, political issues, because if you're interested in something, you're probably also uh, more knowledgeable about something, and it should predict probably how often you dis uh, uh, discuss politics because that is something you enjoy. Um, and what we can then simply do is uh, those we get basically Pearson's correlations, um, um, and we can uh, look at those valid uh, validation correlations and kind of explore whether they are very similar bec uh, between the two modes. And that should be the case if we are measuring the same concept in both modes, and this will probably be the case. Now, I will now propose that we don't stop with such a table, kind of looking at it row by row and going whether it's the same. Um, for one, that is really effortful, especially if we have many variables that we use for validation, which I would recommend. And second, um, it may mislead us because uh, reliability differences play a role here, as we will see in a second. So. What I propose instead is actually taken from a paper uh, by Weston and Rosenthal, and the idea is very nice. So it, on the left side, we see, uh, we see the table uh, previously just graphically represented as a kind of scatter plot. So that table with very similar validation correlations for our measure of political interest across different modes um, can basically be shown as different points which represent on the x-axis the uh, validity in A and the validity in B on the y-axis. And th those points all fall onto a diagonal, a line with slope one. Of course, if, uh, if values are identical, they fall onto the identity diagonal. But what we can do if, in other words, those correlations form a linear trend is basically calculate a correlation over those correlation coefficients. So basically ca uh, calculating a correlation across those two vectors of validation coefficients, ideally a bit more than four, obviously. But uh, for our toy example, it shall be enough. And in our case, uh, it is a rather high correlation. And Weston and Rosenthal call that R alerting CV because they have a talent for math, but not necessarily for naming things. Um, but I call it a correlation of correlations, and I think that is more intuitive. Um, 
And that is already one value with which we can kind of quantify the overall uh, uh, con uh, construct validity comparability across modes, which is really helpful, I think, in more than one way. So if we take that idea a bit further, now imagine we have a scatter plot with more correla uh, uh, correlated um, constructs. And then we have two features that kind of define that relationship intuitively. So the first feature is how far do our correlations spread from the linear trend. And the second feature is the slope of that trend line. And now let's look at when things change. So on the left side, we have the case where we have a wide spread where kind of correlations in one mode are very different from correlations in the other mode. So if you have spread, uh, uh, away from a linear trend, that means uh, this R alerting becomes smaller. This is a sign that our validity coefficients are very different and unsystematically different between the two modes. This may, may imply substantive biases in some or all of the validation variables. Um, on the other hand, if we have that very close fit to a linear trend, this is a good argument for at least uh, some comparable validity across the two modes. Now, that part, I think, is, is pretty obvious. But what happens if the slope changes? So if basically we still have a very good linear trend, but the trend is no longer with a slope of 1. It's no longer the identity diagonal. So the first question is, can that even happen? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, and such a deviation from a slope of 1 will happen if there is an issue in reliability, precisely, actually, if the reliabilities are systematically different between the two modes. This is why I call that comparative attenuation. If there is a reliability problem with the measure in one mode that is not present in the other, um, all correlations will be smaller. And we will see that the linear trend now suddenly has a different slope. So in other words, that approach does not directly quantify the reliability of both measures. But a slope different from one gives us an exploratory idea that there is a comparative reliability difference. So re random error is different in the two modes. Um, I'm not sure how often that will occur, but it's an interesting point to make that this approach kind of for free gives us at least an exploratory insight into reliability. Because as you all know, uh, estimating reliability for single item measures is costly. Think test retest experiments or even multi trade multi method experiments for your specific instrument. Um, and that is not always available to us in the social sciences. So, very helpful. Now, even if we find that validity coefficients are very similar and reliabilities are very similar and no issues occur at all, we still are potentially left with the issue of measurement units. I mean, you might, uh, may, uh, may ask yourself, why is there an issue? Shouldn't that affect correlations? And the answer is, of course, no, not at all, because correlations that we use, Pearson correlations, standardize units, and they're completely oblivious to biases in measurement units across survey modes. So we have to tackle that with a different approach. Um, and that approach is the random groups design, which we will then use to perform equating in a random groups design. But let's start out with the basic uh, experimental design. And at this point, if you say, this is absolutely unrealistic for my project, please be patient for some more slides. I will. Uh, present alternatives. But the basic design, the basic random groups design is nothing else than a random experiment across the two modes where people are randomly uh, invited either into mode A or B, a split ballot experiment, if you like. So what we are doing is we're sampling the same population randomly, for example, people in the UK. And now, uh, in the UK, in the heads of all the citizens, basically, we have a latent distribution of the concept we're trying to measure that is, for example, our political interest measure. And when we sample in modes A and B, we get latent distributions in the two samples. Um, those are not yet data points. Those are true values in the heads of our respondents that we've chosen for the two modes. Now, what we assume here or what we try to, what we have to mitigate, um, what we have to try to control for is the idea that representation doesn't perhaps work perfectly. It never does in, uh, in survey research, 
but it works comparably well across the two modes. So let us assume for a second that both modes have no differences in the errors of representation. People are just as likely to participate in mode A than in mode B. This may not always be the case, but this is a problem we will have to solve different, uh, separately anyway. But for now, let's assume that. That means that the latent distributions in both samples are perhaps not perfectly identical to the target population, but the two sample distributions are the same. So what people have in their heads in our sample for mode A and B is identically distributed now. But what we measure in our survey in the two modes may not be identically distributed. We may perhaps see different response distributions. But since we know that what people have in their heads is identically distributed, we know that we've isolated differences in measurement. So we know the problem lies in the measurement part of the total survey error framework, not in the representation part. Okay, sorry for all that pretext, but if we kind of accept that, or if we have assessed that or ha uh, have mitigated problems previously, then we can apply the following logic to harmonize measurement units. We have an identical latent distribution in both samples. We have, however, different response distributions, which is obviously a mistake. Um, let's simplify that to the average response. If we find average responses for political interest in two samples that represent the same population, then this is obviously a mistake. However, in this specific design, we know it's a measurement mistake and difference in measurement units. So what we can do is basically align the response distribution so that they have the same shape. We do nothing else than recode values in one of those uh, modes so that the response distributions match. In our case, we are recoding the older mode A to fit the new mode B. So how does that look? It's nothing magical. Let's assume we have two response distributions and let's simplify that to just considering the mean and the standard deviation. This is a very simple form of equating more, com uh, more complex models exist, but this is the simplest mod. And now we see that the mean is different in responses, even though the true mean shouldn't be different. So what we then can basically do is rec recode values in A so that the average response matches. Now the average respondent has been aligned. And now we align above and below average respondents by stretching responses in A so that the standard deviations align. And once we have done that, we have aligned to some degree the measurement units between the two modes. Now, as I promised, uh, this, uh, this, this kind of uh, design is perhaps not obtainable to all projects. So what we can do instead indeed is um, look for other survey programs as a second best. And that works like this. So remember we need uh, random samples that kind of refer to the same population, ideally with a similar, uh, with a similar representation performance. So if we, cannot com uh, if we cannot conduct a mode experiment, what we can do instead is simply look to other, uh, to other survey programs which sample the population of interest. So if we have a random sample of, let's say, the adult population of the UK in our survey, which is divided into modes A up to a certain point and then mode B up uh, uh, and, uh, from that point onward, then we can find instances where our survey program sampled the target population and another uh, survey uh, program sampled the same target population in the same year. And we just need one instance of this for mode A and then one instance of this in the same year for mode B. So basically in 2005, we have a link from A to our reference. And in 2015, in this example, we have a link chosen from, to, uh, from our reference to mode B. And what we can then do is called chained equating. We first transform values in A so that they align with the measurement units in the, re uh, uh, in the reference survey program. So basically it also has measured political interest. And now we've made our values uh, before the mode change comparable to the reference. And then we transform those transformed values again towards the uh, mode B. And once we've done that, we have healed the time series by aligning the measurement units. Um, 
it's a bit complex. I, I'm happy to take uh, uh, answer, uh, uh, questions later, but I hope to have at least given you an idea that this could be very helpful potentially, even if you don't have mixed mode experiments. Now, last slide on that topic, some uh, points to consider. Um, just as a reminder, as I said, uh, observed score equating only aligns measurement units. It is a method that, is, that does nothing else than aligning measurement units. If you have differences in systematic and random measurement errors across the modes, it has to be addressed differently. I mean, it doesn't really kind of hurt the equating. It just means that after the equating, we, all, we have those error differences still in our data. It only solves the measurement unit part of the problem. However, that's still a big, big step forward if you have a problem there. The only real drawback in mode comparability is mode dependent errors of representation. So if some people are happy to participate in an interviewer survey, but hate to participate when they have to do it uh, in the internet, for example, then this can create problems because equating assumes that representation works the same in the two modes. If that isn't the case, we have to mitigate differences in representation uh, before applying observed score equating. But well, as you are all aware, we have to mitigate differences in representation anyway to establish uh, mode comparability, but they all come with, you know, with drawbacks. But what I mean by mitigating differences in representation, and this is not my area of expertise, but adjustment weighting is a very simple, naive way of kind of doing that, we stretch our sample to fit what we think the target population looks like, and we can do that for the two modes. So this is something that many programs uh, will probably do and are already doing for their data, uh, for their survey data currently, despite any mode issues. Um, but I would also like to point out that equating has a kind of solution for the same problem, and that is called non-equivalent groups with covariates design. This is the same kind of thing we saw, but as a first step, uh, the algorithm takes into account other variables that we've measured and kind of tries to align the population based on that. It's a logic not unlike uh, used in multiple imputation, for example. So we infer, uh, basically how the scores should look like if the other co covariates were distributed similarly in both samples, for example. Um, but all of such approaches are, of course, a second best to, to actually having comparable representation in both modes, um, because they are blind to things that we don't measure. Unobserved heterogeneity impacts these things um, this is, this is the reason why we, why we do random samples in the first place um, and not just quota uh, samples. Okay, so aligning measurement units. Uh, the last thing I wanted to point out is um, up until now, we kind of looked at an instrument and then the next instrument. And many of the things I just showed are rather easy to at least partially automate and scale and so on. And if you are good in R or Python or whatever, there's lots that can be done. But ideally, we would, we would like to get an idea, especially if you're designing a mode change and we haven't yet collected empirical data, we'd like to have a general idea uh, what a mode change will entail. And so we should be on the lookout for generalizable mode effects. Are there things that generally happen across many different instruments that capture many different topics when I switch, for example, to a self-administered survey? And it just so happens that I'm working a lot on, uh, uh, on the survey quality predictor in the sense that as some of you may already know the survey quality predictor from uh, Willem Saris is moving from Barcelona to Gesis. And I'm kind of uh, looking into that currently as a methodological advisor. And I kind of was surprised and happy to find that, um, that it has many components that may be helpful uh, for mode comparability. But first things first. So for people not familiar with the survey quality predictor, and I assume that many people in the kind of area around the ESS are familiar with it, um, the survey quality predictor is based on a large pool of methodological experiments. So we have many multi-trade, multi-method experiments, which are a kind of um, very elaborate way of assessing the measurement quality that is applicable to single item instruments, things like reliability and aspects of validity and so on and so forth. Uh, in fact, we have 
more than 6,000 instruments for which we have an estimate of their measurement quality in 33 countries. And as a quick side note, uh, the ESS was involved in many of those MTMM experiments. And what was done then was uh, those instruments were coded uh, into a set of formal design characteristics. So for each instrument, uh, there was kind of a checklist: how many uh, how many response options did the uh, uh, did the instrument have? How long was the introduction? Was an interviewer present in that survey where it was used in, and so on and so forth. And then in a the last step. Um, a meta-analysis was conducted that looked into whether we can predict the quality of those separate instruments by taking into account only those formal design characteristics. Um, and those are what I mean by generalizable method effects, things that have an effect across many different instruments that measure many different uh, uh, substantive concepts. Now, for users of the SQP, this is obviously not what you would see. Instead, uh, as a user of the SQP, you would code your own instrument, which uh, where you want to assess the quality. And then the SQP kind of works like Amazon. It goes like customers uh, like you tend to have bought that as well. Uh, and the SQP says, OK, instruments that kind of look like the instrument you've just coded performed in a certain way in our pool of MTMM experiments. You get, in other words, a quality estimate and also a range of qualities that are present in the pool that the meta-analysis draws upon. I'm obviously simplifying things a bit, but this is the basic gist. Um, at this point in time, you may, of course, ask yourself, why is that relevant for mode harmonization? Um, but as it turns out, some of those formal design characteristics have a strong relevance for mode questions. So some of those characteristics were, for example, whether a visual aid was used. And if so, was it a horizontal or a vertical scale, for example? Remember the switch to vertical scales on smartphone screens? Well, maybe some insight is already in the pool of MTMM experiments. There's also the question of whether answers were registered in a computer-assisted fashion, which may point towards things like errors in data collection between modes. Uh, was an interviewer present or was it a self-completion kind of mode? Was it a visual or oral presentation? So obviously all things that are of interest to survey mode harmonization. But just because it's part of the formal design characteristics, we still have to ask ourselves, what can we do in concrete terms? Well, the easiest part is to say, OK, I have a specific instrument, and then I kind of code it in the SQP, and I kind of uh, I just switch out the part that is relevant for my mode, so interviewer for self-completion, for example. And then I look whether the SQP thinks there is, a, uh, there, is a, um, there is an overall quality difference across the instruments that make up the experiment pool it's based on. So this is just, this will not perfectly predict whether your specific instrument will have a problem, but it gives you an idea whether in general a problem occurs between instruments that are designed similarly that, uh, that may already give you some confidence. But to my mind, it's more interesting that we may perhaps use that wealth of data to kind of look into the meta-analysis itself and ask ourselves, are there generalizable effects that we can attribute to a specific design choice relevant for modes? Can we kind of extract an idea how much of a mode effect or quality differences are, uh, are due to an interviewer being present or a self-completion mode, for example? And that is certainly something uh, where we need a meta-analytic approach, and it just so happens that we have a really interesting data set here. Um, and the second thing is, it is a meta-analytic framework that may perhaps be enriched with further MTMM experiments. So if people are assessing their mo instruments in different modes, why not do an MTMM experiment, which has many interesting properties? And then it may be become part of the pool of the SQP meta-analysis, and then you can make use of the other data points as well, perhaps. Those are, of course, ideas. Um, Barbara Felderer, who is responsible here at GESIS for conducting the new version of the meta-analysis open to research collaboration, if, if that is something you find interesting. And I think it is an interesting perspective, primarily using meta-analytic approaches, but perhaps in conjunction with what is already present in in the SQP. Now, on to the last few slides to kind of draw a package. So we've weighed 
different modes. And I think I have given you some idea that the problem is rather complex, but it is also conquerable with things that for the most part are nothing new actually. Um, and I think we can not only assess problems, some of those can actually be mitigated, which is I think very helpful. But a question that still kind of that I implied but haven't really discussed is the idea of generalizability. So over time and in the research field, we will increasingly have to think about how generalizable mode effects are. I tend towards looking at instruments separately because I'm kind of more on the each instrument works differently until I have kind of confirmed that it that it kind of works like other instruments. That's an empirical question. But it may be that the more we look into mode effects, the more and more patterns will emerge that are generalizable. For example, generalizable across questions about many different topics, or generalizable across countries and cultures, which is extremely important for cross-cultural survey programs. And some issues may be generalizable across different types of respondents. Or on the other hand, some issues may actually be specific to certain populations where we have to take extra care. Um, when we apply a certain survey mode. So the search for generalizable effects will probably be on the ongoing and future topic in mode research, because this would increase our efficiency enormously if we just could go and quantifying an effect once, and then I can be pretty sure it will happen in the next survey or with another instrument as well. Um, but for some questions, I think that is still an, an ongoing discussion and not really something where we have reached a final answer yet. Last slide. Um, on my last slide, I want to instill as a perspective going out uh, something I think of as healthy pragmatism. So I talked a lot about how things can go horribly wrong and the very complex things we have to do to ensure that they don't. And modes can certainly matter, but please consider the possibility that for your research project or for the things you want to analyze, modes may not matter all that much. There's nothing to say that a change in mode creates horrible differences in measurement, for example. Um, it may be that we measure things very similarly. There was a long discussion on whether we can assess something uh, 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 in, in web surveys or whether that is horrible, horrible junk responses and so on and so forth. But now we have gained quite a bit of confidence that we can reliably ask people about social and psychological realities via web surveys, for example. So it may not matter all that much for every project. Just be aware that it can matter and that you should assess it. And um, there is also something I see a lot when I consult on harmonization, that is comparability brings into brings methodological issues into sharp contrast. I mean, that's actually an advantage. Comparing different data sources can unveil problems with those data sources, modes, for example, um, that were invisible if I just look at those issues separately. But it can also tempt us to be extremely strict about those things. So please keep in mind that we should kind of still uh, kind of choose a level of strictness with uh, methodological issues that we would also apply to single mode data, um, because it is sometimes tempting to get lost in all of those potential little problems. Um, and we should stay with the bigger picture, whether it's actually still, you know, acceptable. And the last issue, issue is, as I said, once we have quantified issues, we have gone a long way to already mitigating the issues. So the problem is often finding comparability issues, but once we have, and we have measured their extent, we can correct for them. As we've seen, we can correct measurement unit differences with observed score equating. And if we find differences in random error, for example, we can apply a correction for attenuation to get an idea how things would be if they were more comparable. So nothing is lost even if we have collected the data, if we can just quantify uh, the comparability issues. Um, I will make the slides available and you will find some resources on them. And for now, I thank you for your attention. I'm looking very much forward to your questions and comments.